Everybody, if we could uh, please come and collect ourselves, uh, we're going to get started here today. It's about 12.05. Thank you for coming. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Richard Benson. I'm a 3L graduating in, what is it now, 46 days? Looking forward to that. But uh, I'm the immediate past president of the Federalist Society here, and I want to thank John Fox for letting me do this introduction as one last hurrah. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Federalist Society at Mauer exists to provide a forum for debate and discussion on difficult topics and provide an avenue for discussing the proper role of the judiciary. While Nationals does lean right, the chapter here at Mauer is committed to a fair and open dialogue with the board representing different politics, races, genders, and orientations. We are a nonpartisan 501c3 and do not endorse anyone for election to office or a particular appointment to a court. The board has quite many perspectives on hot topics, but one thing we all agree on is that we as future attorneys have our education advanced when experts come and share and defend their wisdom. Leading this chapter has been my greatest joy of my time here at Mauer. If I can leave the school with any thought to the one else we're going to be taking over, is that you cannot evangelize and antagonize at the same time. In our culture of excess hostility, it is at least partially up to us as future attorneys to promote civil, educated dialogue and see that we respect the fundamental dignity and goodwill in every human person. Today's talk has no departure from that norm. It is our hope that this event will give you, as students and faculty, access to the judiciary and help you craft your plans for potential future judicial service, all through a friendly dialogue format. To provide an outline of today's events, Professor Sanders and Justice Slaughter will have about 40 minutes to talk about his journey from Maurer to the court. Afterward, we'll have a Q&A for about 10 minutes. We have been approved for one hour of Indiana continuing legal education credit, and the forms are outside on the table. Please sign before 1230 when we have to take the form back. And otherwise, please remember that Justice Slaughter is a sitting Supreme Court justice, uh, for the, and uh, thus, uh, please do not ask any political questions when we get to Q&A or anything that will prejudice the case. This event is being recorded and will be preserved for posterity on YouTube, so don't do anything a reasonable person wouldn't want to be preserved. <laughs> and uh, moving on to today's event, uh, we are pleased to present uh, you Professor Steve Sanders and Justice Jeffrey Slaughter. Professor Sanders joined the Maurer faculty in 2013 with the JD from Michigan in 2005 and an undergraduate degree from here at IU in 1984. He then clerked for Judge Evans on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals before joining Mayor Brown's practice in Chicago um, doing Supreme Court work. Professor Sanders is a good friend of the chapter here. He is on record on multiple occasions saying that his politics disagree with National FedSoc, but he appreciates our support of freedom of speech and dialogue and is more than happy to participate in our events. We are very appreciative of his time. For his fearlessness and his love of his students, Professor Sanders recently won the teaching award that Balsa handed out last month at the Barrister's Ball. Very well deserved indeed. Please welcome Professor Sanders. And now to our guest of honor. I won't go deep in detail in the biography because part of today's goal is to have him tell his story. Justice Slaughter is the son of a school teacher and a journalist. He graduated from here, the Maurer School of Law, with a JD MBA in 1989. He worked for Kirkland and Ellis in Chicago before becoming special counsel of the Indiana Attorney General and then on to Taft, uh, Stettinus, and Hollister in 2001, where he attained the Partnership in Complex Litigation. In 2015, uh, Justice Dixon retired from the court, and Justice Slaughter was selected by then-Governor Pence out of a pool of 29 highly qualified applicants to sit on the Indiana Supreme Court. Please welcome Professor Sanders and Justice Jeffrey Slaughter, and we hope you enjoy From Indiana Law to the Indiana Supreme Court. Okay. Um, let me, uh, let me also add my thanks to you for being here. Um, let me just start off. So, um, Justice Slaughter, um, you were named to the court less than a year ago. I think I saw you here last year at an event at the Board of Visitors, and you were in practice at that time. This is shortly thereafter your selection was announced. Um, I'm just wondering, how has your daily life changed since going from being a litigator in private practice to being on a state Supreme Court? Uh, you know, what did you expect being a justice would be like, and have there been any surprises? Well, among other things, my life changed in that I'm no longer keeping track of every six minutes of my professional day, <laughs> as I used to do as a practicing lawyer for a lot of years. Um, the, the, the work is very rich and rewarding. Um, I had had the privilege of uh, spending a lot of time as a practicing lawyer doing a lot of appellate work, uh, litigating in our s state appellate courts, including our state's highest court, um, this, including uh, in, in the Seventh Circuit, but wasn't sure that I'd ever had the chance to sit on the other side of the bench. And it's been a real, it's been a real thrill, a real privilege. Um, I love the appellate practice, as I know you do, mm -hmm. Professor Sanders, and you're very good at it. And I hope we get a chance to see you in our court one day <laughs> soon. Um, 
But uh, my, my life has changed a great deal. Um, among other things, I've learned from my colleagues that my jokes are funnier now that I'm a sitting judge <laughs> than when I was a practicing lawyer. Um, but uh, the, the work is uh, much, much of what I do today as a, as a sitting judge is a lot of what I did as a practicing appellate lawyer in that mine, unlike a lot of litigators, I wasn't a trial lawyer. Um, you would call the, the, the uh, malpractice carrier before you'd send me in to try a case because that's just not what I did. But I did a lot of litigation, motions practice in trial courts, um, arguing appeals, writing appellate briefs, and that's really the nature of what I do now. I do a lot of researching and writing and thinking about what the the issues that come before us, and uh, it's it's enormously rewarding. I feel really privileged to be able to do it. And, and before we sort of talk about your biography and how you got here, um, it, it, for those who don't know, so um, Indiana is a state that appoints its uh, – the governor appoints Supreme Court justices. You're not confirmed by the legislature, right? It's just a gubernatorial Correct. appointment um, uh, 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 based on a, a, a sort of merit selection or, or a, in, in theory. A, 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 a group of candidates uh, presented to the governor. But then there is, the, the voters get a say because, correct me if I'm wrong, after two years you're subject to a retention vote, That's and correct. then after that you're good for another ten years until another retention vote. I, I'm just curious, so during this two-year period, are you feeling particularly cautious or under scrutiny? Or uh, I, Short answer is no. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm doing the best I can with the cases that come before us, and my job as uh, a sending member of the court is to uh, uh, interpret the law as best I can given the, the statute that the legislature has written or the constitutional principles that apply. And if in a year and a half, uh, November of 2018, the, the voters of Indiana say, sorry, Slaughter, um, you're not what we had in mind, uh, go find go do something else. I will have enjoyed my two-plus years in the court, and I'll go do something else. But um, one, one doesn't and, look and I, ahead I think there's to the a election. thin possibility that anything like well, that would happen. Um, that's never in, – in the 50 years that we've had a judicial retention system in, the, in Indiana, nobody has ever not been retained, but I figure there's a first time for everything. So what's <laughs> we'll see. So um, why – back then it wasn't called the Maurer School of Law. It was the IU School of Law. You were – you majored in economics here uh, as an undergraduate, and then you uh, uh, did a joint MBA and JD, as I recall That's correct. correctly. My, so, my MBA was in finance from – What's well, now Kelly. It wasn't yeah, Kelly yeah. then either. So why the IU School of Law? What, what made um, you decide to well, stay here? You grew up in Crown Point, I should I, say. I You're a Hoosier. I'm a native right? Hoosier. I grew up in uh, Lake County, about 35 miles outside Chicago. Um, came to Bloomington. I loved my four years in Bloomington. I had looked at any number of other law schools and, wisely or not, decided to apply only here. Um, had I not gotten in, I might be selling shoes for a living or doing something <laughs> else entirely. But I love Bloomington. Um, IU then and now is a, a, a very fine school. Um, had wonderful professors when I was here and decided that I was going to stay in Bloomington for law school. Um, glad I did. Have no regrets. Um, the uh, cost of living cost of going to school back then was, I suspect, far less expensive than it is now. But you were all in as a law student here. Um, books, tuition, room board, beer money, you name it, for under 10000 bucks. Wow. And, of course, you didn't you, the, the prospect of going even to a large firm and making six figures was unheard of. So there's been escalation on both sides of the equation. Right. But um, it was a, a wonderful school, and uh, I got a first-rate legal education here, and I've had any number of mm-hmm. terrific professional opportunities since graduating. So I have nothing but uh, great uh, affection for the, the Maurer School of Law. So, so although the cost may have changed a little bit, one thing that maybe hasn't changed is that law students presumably um, – Many sort of don't know what they'll end up doing or are thinking about various paths. When you were in law school, what did you imagine you wanted to do as a lawyer? What possibilities did you see? Did you always know you wanted to litigate? What what went through your mind as a law student about where you wanted to be in 5, 10, 20 years? Well, I was, as as Professor Sanders mentioned, I was in the joint degree program uh, with the business school. Um, I got my MBA in finance and was on a track at the law school to do transactional work, uh, M&A work. Um, I took a lot of Professor Hicks's classes in corporate finance, securities regulation. I thought I wanted to be a transactional lawyer, and I was quickly disabused of that um, during part of one summer in Chicago, a large <laughs> firm that that I worked for as a summer associate, um, got assigned to some some deals, and I learned 
really fast that transactional work just is not my cup of tea. Um, drafting deal documents was about as dreadful a thing, frankly, as I could imagine. That just wasn't, you know, different strokes for different folks, but that was not my, um, that was not my bailiwick. Um, I wound up spending some time that summer with a few lawyers in the appellate practice and antitrust group. There was a great deal of overlap in Kirkland's Chicago office at the time. And I fell, fell in love with that work, the intellectual challenge that it presented, and um, really have been doing that kind of work ever since. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, you and I have known each other for actually more than 30 years, and we were talking at the beginning about trying to figure out uh, how we had actually met. The one thing I do remember is that um, I was the editor of the editorial page, the opinion page for the IDS, the daily student here, and you came on board uh, as a law student, which was rather unusual for a non-journalism major to work on the daily student, but came on board and wrote editorials and, and, and was a member of the editorial board. You were a member of the opinion board. What I call about you was you had these Careful. What, what, what at the time were, were intriguing and rather exotic sort of libertarian views. I mean, views that were sort of maybe conventionally conservative in some senses, but actually quite unconventional in other senses for a self-defined conservative. So this is a FedSoc event, and, and I kind of want to talk about what the roots of your uh, sort of your, your personal philosophy and your political thinking were, what drew you to, and, and have uh, 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 why have you maintained uh, an affiliation with the Federalist Society over the years? Sure. Well, I, as an undergrad here at, at Bloomington, <clears throat> was active in college Republicans. Um, a few friends and I from that college Republicans conservative type movement had thought about uh, undertaken to start a conservative alternative newspaper that went nowhere fast. I'm not sure we ever actually, I think we collected some articles, I'm not sure if we ever published an issue, but um, was very much as an economics major, took a lot of classes in philosophy and political science. Um, I was, even as, a, as an undergrad, drawn to uh, the libertarian economists, the uh, the Milton Friedmans mm -hmm. and others from the University of Chicago in particular. And when I joined the law school, I matriculated in the fall of uh, 1985. Uh, the Federalist Society was then, I think, just a two- or three-year-old mm -hmm. institution. But it was, as Richard uh, Benson pointed out, uh, has been for a long time committed to uh, conservative and, and, and libertarian principles. And that's something that I thought I wanted to, to get involved with. And was active in the, the student chapter while in law school. And uh, for a little bit while in Chicago, but then was even uh, lawyer's chapter president in Indianapolis for several years before turning over the reins to, uh, to my successor, who has just taken the chapter to a new level and is doing a great job with it. But, but those kinds of political, philosophical um, underpinnings are things that have been of interest to me for a long, long time. Can you remain involved? I mean, I mean, so I'm involved in the American Constitution Society, and we certainly have sitting judges participating in ACS events nationally. Do you remain involved with, with FedSoc? I, I think I'm still on the board of directors for the Indiana Indianapolis Lawyers Chapter. I'm not sure mm -hmm. what that means as a practical matter. Um, um, I'm the immediate past president, which is about the best title you can have as part of any organization. Um, but I go to their, their luncheon meetings with some regularity. Um, I, there, I think there's a, a summer program for Midwest chapters mm -hmm. uh, in, in Chicago in April or May. If my schedule permits, I'll go up and mm -hmm. try to participate in that. So I'm um, at least tangentially involved in the organization and try to, try to continue to participate. Um, I've not yet encountered any professional conflict that prevents me from doing a particular matter. So, so um, after law school, but before entering practice, um, you clerked for a federal district judge, Alan Sharp, on the Northern District of Indiana. And, and we should all <clears throat> count ourselves lucky in our careers to find important mentors who help us or who inspire us, who provide a role model. I know that um, Judge Sharp was an important mentor to you. What was that experience like? What did you learn from that experience as a just out of law school clerking for a federal judge? It was, it was a wonderful experience. And if any of you think you might be interested in clerking, I strongly encourage you to go through the process, whether it's a federal judicial clerkship, whether it's a clerkship on our court or a state intermediate appellate court, um, any chance to see how the sausage is made in the judicial system from the other side of the bench, I think you'll, you'll find to be an enormously rewarding opportunity. Uh, Judge Sharp uh, is a Maurer alum. He was in the class of 57, along with former Governor Frank O'Bannon 
and you know, do you know the name Fred Eichhorn, who was a longtime member of the I Board of trustee, Trustees, yeah. and I think was president of the Board of Trustees. They were all part of the class of 57, um, and were good friends in law school with class of 56 alums, Lee Hamilton and Shirley Abrahamson, of course, mm, yeah. I think former Chief Justice of the Wisconsin Supreme Court. But Judge Sharp was a 1973 Nixon appointee to the district court, had been elected to our appellate court in Indiana before he was appointed to the federal bench, and had been 15, 16 years on the federal bench when I joined his chambers in 1989, right after graduation. Um, and he, the chance to sit at the right hand of a very experienced, seasoned district judge was, I, I found, to be a, a great experience. Um, he clearly loved and I think thrived in the courtroom more than he did um, writing opinions. Um, I, on the other hand, loved writing opinions and wasn't so much interested in the in-court procedure. So in, in that sense, we, we complemented each other well, though, of course, he had far more to teach me than, than I ever did him. But uh, I found him to be a terrific mentor and friend. Um, I learned as much about life from him as I did about the law, but uh, he was in, in some respect. How so? Respect, How so? Um, well, he was a very uh, street smart, savvy uh, fellow. He was, as he would say, he was born with dirt between his toes in Brown County. Mm -hmm. um, his there were about 18 people in his high school, mm -hmm. none of whom, none of whom I think one of other, one other of whom he actually went to college, let alone law school, let alone become a, becoming a federal judge. Um, he came from a broken family. Uh, there are any number of reasons that he might not have succeeded, but he mm -hmm. uh, is a, a true great, a great Indiana and American success story and uh, read people very well. He was enormously well-read. He had the same uh, affliction that I do of being a, a fan of the Chicago Cubs. Of course, now that's actually a, a, a trending point, thing. Yeah. That's right. It, uh, who, who knew? Right. Um, but... Uh, he a, a, was a history buff. Um, I interviewed with any number of uh, federal judges when I was getting ready to go to, to graduate from law school, and I got, was fortunate to get several callbacks, um, including a Seventh Circuit judge. Um, in, in my case, I, they just say pick the professor, not the court. I picked the judge, not the court, hmm. um, because my interview with Judge Sharp was about three hours, and we talked about everything from politics to baseball to history, to, and that was a... And, and that tr proved to be a, 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 a sort of the opening to what uh, became a very rewarding mm -hmm. uh, two-year clerkship in his chambers as well. I want to um, jump ahead a little bit of going in chronological order and just ask, um, you have law clerks now in your position, I, I assume. I don't know if you, if you hired them or inherited them, but how do you use your own law clerks? Sure. What's your relationship with them? I, like? I should say I have none yet from Maurer, but I hope, uh, hope some of you will consider applying. i uh, love to have a... A Mauer when, when along do you in my chambers. Seat them? What's the timetable? Well, they're two-year clerkships. I have two clerks. Uh, we rotate. Um, I inherited one who was first in her class at McKinney uh, last year, two years ago. She would clerked for the chief justice and was rotating out of her chambers. And the chief said, the chief, by the way, who was also a Mauer alum, uh, said, um, if you're you're interested in uh, a clerk who's been around the, the block a little bit. That is, she knows the court. She knows what it's like to hand down an opinion. I had no idea what that was all about, so I thought it would be worthwhile to have somebody who actually knows what he or she is doing. Um, another law clerk who just came on board graduated last year. Um, Peter's in the first of a two-year clerkship. He graduated from the University of Chicago. Uh, Amanda's successor will come on board this coming fall. He's he was graduated from Notre Dame. Um, so I'll have another vacancy in the fall of 2018. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that timetable works out for any of you, but uh, if it's something you think you might want to do, I hope you'll, hope you'll apply. But uh, um, I, I tell them, your only job is to prop me up and make me look good. <laughs> and they're, they're, they've usually been, been very, very what, successful. What does that. that involve? How do you um, use your clerks? I, I ask that they, they really get involved in, in any number of ways, from legal research to drafting a, a, initial drafts of opinions. They help me prepare for oral arguments. They'll assist the, uh, the transfer review process. Um, I may be telling you something you already know, but like the Supreme Court of the United States, the overwhelming majority of our jurisdiction is discretionary. There may be 5% on, on the high end of cases that we hear that are within our mandatory jurisdiction, which you bypass the, court, the Intermediate Court of Appeals and there's a direct appeal to our court. Typically, those are criminal cases, though not exclusively. Um, in a criminal case where a death sentence has been imposed or what's known as LWOP, life without parole, those come immediately to us. Uh, on the civil side, 
um, if a state or federal statute has been declared unconstitutional in whole or in part, those cases come to us as well directly by passing the Court of Appeals. But everything else is, is within our discretionary jurisdiction. So we have typically, and this varies from year to year, about a thousand transfer petitions, and we'll grant about 10% of those historically. That's what the U.S. Supreme Court is known as certiorari. It's referred to as transfer That's right. here. That's exactly right. Um, now, in the year since I've joined the court, and I'll leave it to others who study our court and the, our state judiciary uh, more closely than I do, um, I'm, since I'm actually part of it right now, I haven't had the chance for detachment or reflection that, that others may, but we are actually getting fewer transfer petitions. Um, part of that, of course, is just a process of how many cases are getting appealed and decided by our Court of Appeals, but we're also granting appreciably fewer. The grant rate is down probably 25% from just, just a year ago. So, for example, we had two years ago, uh, we're on a fiscal year, July 1 to June 30 fiscal year, uh, we had 100 opinions written decisions uh, two years ago. Last year we had 85. This year we, will, we may not have 70. Um, and the grant rate has gone from about 10% to under 8%. Um, also the allocation of the cases that we, that we are, are hearing um, has changed fairly appreciably. Probably two-thirds of our transfer petitions are criminal petitions. And it used to be the case that we would grant transfer in probably 60% of the cases. 40, 60% of our cases would be criminal. 40% would be civil. In just the last year, that's switched. It's now about 55, 45 civil. And I won't be surprised if that number, the, number, the percentage of civil goes up as well. Is there anything that drives that? Well, um, Part of it has to do with what we consider to be a transfer-worthy case. And depending on which of my colleagues are asking at any time, that, those, uh, that, that, uh, that may, may differ. Um, I think among all of us we agree that our court is not simply to sit as a court of error to review any, decision, any errors that may have occurred in the cases below. Our job is to pronounce what the law should be uh, writ large. If there, and that, typically that involves resolving conflicts among lower courts. If there is a, an existing precedent of ours that has been misapplied by lower courts, we, we clarify things. We set the record straight. <clears throat> Sometimes that we find that it's important that existing precedent be reconsidered. Um, and we'll grant transfer for those for those reasons, but um, we, we don't always agree necessarily on how those criteria get applied in a particular case, and that's what. So just because uh, again, I, I think so much of what law students get exposed to is is about federal law uh, outside maybe the first year curriculum. Most of your court's work is is obviously about state law. What are some of the specific issues you've been involved with? Uh, in deciding since joining the court. I think you've authored two opinions uh, that I at least saw in the last uh, I think I'm up to four or five than, okay. plus a couple of dissents. Okay, all right. Um, uh, so uh, what are the uh, criminal law, I said family law is prominent family on the docket law. of your court. What other kinds of issues tend to dominate uh, the things you have to think about and research and write about well, um, on a daily basis? Certainly any number of property law questions, uh, tort law disputes, what the, the common law tort principles shall be in Indiana, um, any number of brief of contract, commercial law questions, all these state law questions that you're learning in your, your property and tort law classes, contracts classes, are the issues that come before us. And, of course, on issues of state law, we're the final arbiter of what state law means. We even We, we have a fair number of federal and state law constitutional questions that come before us, both in civil cases as well, of course, in criminal cases. We get a number of uh, federal constitutional issues, Fourth Amendment and Sixth Amendment issues in particular in the criminal cases that we hear. But it's really a nice, rich variety of, uh, of uh, any number of disciplines. Do you get many constitutional constitutional law questions? Uh, you mentioned Fourth Amendment. A lot of that is coming up in the context of, I assume, exclusionary uh, rule issues that's and so forth. So that's, that's what are exactly kinds right. of constitutional issues? Um, well, we have uh, actually a couple of cases pending. I don't want to spend, I don't want to talk too much about those, but um, for example, we had um, a, a statutory question last fall. Um, it's now a published decision, a 5-0 decision from our court, but the question was under our state public record statute. You may be familiar with uh, the, the Federal Freedom of Information Act, FOIA, there's a state counterpart to that, the Access to Public Records Act. And the state law question, the statutory question that was before us was whether uh, it was styled ESPN versus the University of Notre Dame. Yeah. And the question was whether Notre Dame, as uh, although a private 
Catholic institution um, because its board of trustees had voted to give its give police power authority to its university police department, um, with arrest powers and so on. Whether that, as a matter of state statutory law, made Notre Dame either Notre Dame writ large or at least its police department a public agency sub subject to a public records request because ESPN was doing a story on any number of mm -hmm. um, college athletes who'd been arrested for any number of kinds of charges. In the process of litigating the state law question, any number of federal constitutional issues were raised as well, including some First Amendment um, establishment clause issues and free exercise um, as, because it's a, a religious Catholic uh, mm -hmm. institution. Okay. I want to... Um uh, uh, sort of go back and talk about your time in private practice, uh, building up to sort of was it difficult to transition from being a an advocate to now being a neutral decision maker? How does your frame of mind uh, 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 have to have to differ? But, but first, what were the um, what did you your years in private practice? Many students here may spend time in in small, medium, large law firms. What were the pros? What were the cons? What did you enjoy about being a big firm litigator for much of your career? What did you not enjoy as much? Um, well, you mentioned billing your time out every six minutes. Well, and of course, I'm, and that's largely a jest because uh, billable hours, as you well know, are the, the lifeblood of a law firm. So um, it, in my both former firms, if you didn't bill your time, you didn't get paid. And I don't care if you're the most junior associate or the most senior partner. Um, that's, that's how it worked. Um, I, I loved my, my time in private practice, both at Kirkland and locally uh, in Indianapolis with Taft. Um, certainly some of the benefits of being involved in a large firm are uh, deep-pocketed clients that have often very interesting, sophisticated legal questions that are brought to bear. Um, I hate to say money is no object because money is always an object, but particularly an important uh, Bet the company litigation. Um, you throw whatever resources are needed to uh, address a, a legal problem, whether the, the client is prosecuting a claim or is defending a claim that could turn out to be bet the company. Um, but in, in part of the part of the attraction of a large firm that I found was that um, it has it, it had the resources to afford somebody who had kind of a niche practice that I did. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not a trial lawyer. I did a lot of thinking and noodling with colleagues, um, sometimes strategic thinking with colleagues or clients um, about how to advance the ball. Um, often it involved particular pieces of litigation, but sometimes it just involved um, business strategy and how to accomplish the, the big picture goal despite what might be some short-term obstacles. And not a lot of smaller firms could justify the expense of having somebody with my kind of oddball practice area on, uh, on, on the payroll. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you have a large firm and those kinds of resources, um, you have a, necessarily a, a broad toolbox to, to bring to bear to, to clients that have any number of, of needs, whether it's a, a local dispute involving local issues, uh, state, federal issues, and of course now with the, the, uh, the global marketplace in which we all uh, do business, um, international norms that are often uh, involve highly sophisticated questions. Uh, what's, what's the downside of, of a large firm? Um, they, you, you work hard when you're at a large firm. Uh, it's not a, they, some firms have a reputation that's deserved for being a sweatshop. Um, that, that goes with the territory. Um, there also, there's also a greater bureaucracy associated with larger firms. Um, the Indianapolis firm that I joined right, off, right out of the Attorney General's office that eventually merged with Taft, I think there were probably 40 lawyers when I joined it. There were maybe 100 lawyers when we merged with Taft eight years later. Um, we were on the lax end of the um, the bureaucratic scale. Taft, on the other hand, I mean, no, no disrespect when I say this, this is just the nature of the beast. Taft was probably more bureaucratic than um, other firms their size. So we went from a fairly lax environment to a fairly bureaucratic environment with a lot of rules and committees, and uh, this is the way we do things. And um, that can be not always, it can be kind of a stifling environment, but that's a, really, it's a small detail. Um, I enjoyed enormously my time both at Taft and, and Kirkland. You described how sort of fairly early on you, you discovered that transactional practice was not your thing, but that uh, appellate litigation, writing briefs, thinking about legal issues, making legal arguments was. Um, what advice do you have for students about sort of uh, reflecting on their own strengths and weaknesses and comfort levels. I, I mean, is there a relationship there between sort of knowing yourself and almost your, your own personality and what 
area of practice makes sense for you to think about as a lawyer? Um, if you're more attuned to your own interests and aptitudes than I was, I, I wish you well, because I, it took me to actually do some, uh, any number of things that I found out this just isn't for me before I really found my, my niche. And it turned out my niche is what my father, who is far wiser than I, uh, suspected I would wind up doing, which is really being a, a professional writer, whether as a journalist or an academic or as, mm -hmm. a, as a sitting judge. As Richard mentioned in his introduction, uh, my father was a newspaper man, and uh, I loved as a very young boy, came to appreciate the crafting a sentence and then a paragraph and putting together an argument. Um, you know, different, different strokes for different folks. I had a number of colleagues who would just say, Slaughter, I don't know how you do that for a living. I would be bored to tears with, mm -hmm. with, with writing. They're you know, trial lawyers or do something else. They're, they're, they're deal makers who are on the phone all day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that's, that's what makes the world go around. But I, I learned fairly young that that's what I would enjoy doing, though it didn't occur to me as I was getting out of law school that that's what I would want to do. But sure enough, I wound up gravitating to, to fulfill something that I really had a great deal of passion for. And that remains to this day. You also spend some time, as many lawyers do, in, in government service. You work for the Indiana Attorney That's General's right. office in between um, stints at firms. What did you do in the AG's office? Well, my, my position there was, was special counsel to the Attorney General. Um, it was largely legal policy. Was, I was a litigator, um, did a lot of uh, legal policy questions. I tended to be involved in cases that were legally and or politically significant to the Attorney General, to the state of Indiana. Um, I got involved in any number of cases. Probably the most prominent was the series of national lawsuits that the state of Indiana joined. Jeff Mata said, who was the second AG whom I worked for. Um, he was the, the Attorney General who brought suit against the tobacco industries and wound up in the eventual 50-state settlement, the $200 billion-plus national settlement with the tobacco companies. But um, Modisette was a fairly early Attorney General in the uh, in the, the litigation against the tobacco companies, which found me in the somewhat awkward, but it was actually a fun prospect of going up against some of my former mates um, at K&E who represented uh, one of the big tobacco companies. But uh, mm -hmm. I, hadn't been, I hadn't worked on those cases, so happily I wasn't conflicted out. And it was a, a, a real, it, it was a neat opportunity to see that other side of the, of the, the litigation. Okay. So you did that, then you went back into private practice with a firm, I'm forgetting S the- Summer Barnard. S Summer Barnard, which, which, which became part of a, uh, a larger firm based out of Ohio, uh, a Taft. Uh, you had a, a very successful practice. You're a partner at a firm. You're doing, as you said, a kind of niche practice that you love. Um, what made you decide to apply for the Indiana Supreme Court? What is that process like before you get to the interview with the governor? Um, well, it, in Indiana, as Professor Sanders mentioned, we have a judicial nominating commission. And, and if I may just back up briefly, this is the third select, selection process we have in Indiana for choosing judges. Um, in the 1816 Constitution, that we just, for which we just celebrated the bicentennial, we had what was then a federal, what was effectively a federal model: nomination by the governor, by the executive, uh, confirmation by the Senate. Um, under the 1851 Constitution, reflecting little belatedly, the Jacksonian era, we went to direct election of, hmm. of, of our statewide judges. Uh, Judge Sharper, whom I clerked, was elected in 1968 to the appellate court because hmm. just like members of the executive and legislative branches, the judicial branch also was hmm. directly elected by the people. And then um, in 1970, we changed our constitution again to reflect what's now the current uh, system. Uh, we've had almost 50 years now, which is the, the Missouri plan, kind of a progressive era belief in that we, we should rely on trust experts who have familiarity with the legal process to help select our judges. And that's the system that's been in place now for 47 years. Um, it's a seven-member commission chaired by the Chief Justice of Indiana. Uh, there are three lawyers th from three different geographic districts appointed by members of the bar. There are also three non-lawyer members appointed by the governor. And those seven, when there is a vacancy in our court, our court of appeals, or in the tax court, I understand parenthetically that Judge Wentworth was here within the last couple of weeks and held a, a tax court oral argument here. Her, her court also is selected through the judicial, that judicial selection process. But those seven, when there's a vacancy in one of the courts, um, will invite applications and conduct interviews. In fact, um, my 
colleague, uh, Justice Robert Rucker, who is the longest serving member of our court, he was appointed by Governor O'Bannon in 1999, announced that he's stepping down in just a couple of months. Um, the applications have been filed. I think there are 20 interview, people who are being interviewed. Um, interviews start tomorrow in Indianapolis in our conference room. Um, the, the 20 will get interviewed over the next couple of days. Um, I'm, there will be some unspecified number of semifinalists who are invited back for a second round of interviews. And I think the chief's goal is to have three finalists' names for the governor by the end of April. And then under, under our constitution, he has 60 days in which to make the appointment. Now, there's a never previously invoked provision, and you'll understand why, that if the governor doesn't make that choice within 60 days, the chief justice gets to pick. Mm. Well, as you might imagine, no governor has ever passed up the chance to yeah. make that appointment, but in theory, that uh, that fallback position exists. So uh, what, what motivated you to, uh, uh -huh. to give this a shot? Um, well, even from my time in law school, um, I thought that it would be uh, a, a neat opportunity to serve as, a, as an appellate judge. Um, I should tell you that when I applied this time, I came this close to not applying. I had applied twice previously unsuccessfully, and uh, most recently in 2012 when I applied unsuccessfully, um, I was a finalist along with um, a judge from Tippecanoe County, Loretta Rush, who is Maurer class of 83. Mm -hmm. um, Governor Daniels wound up choosing uh, now Chief Justice Rush to our court. And um, although I was a finalist and came close, uh, close but no cigar, um, my practice had really taken off since then. And I was enjoying what I was doing. I was making more money than I ever, ever, had ever made before, not really looking to, to, to make a change. And two uh, particularly strong women in my life uh, persuaded me they ought to uh, apply for the vacancy that came up last year. Uh, my wife said, you'll never forgive yourself if you let this chance pass. Um, you may not get a chance, but you'll never know. And then, as luck would have it, um, I was, my, this was a couple of years ago, I was at the time the president of the Indiana Bar Foundation, which is the um, charitable arm of the State Bar Association, and I was presiding over a function uh, at which, in fact, I was introducing the Chief Justice, and she said afterward, I hope you'll plan to apply for our court. I, and I said, yeah, yeah, thank you. That's, that's really nice. I appreciate that, but yada, yada. She said, no, I mean it. I, I expect, I, I really want to see you apply. And I thought, well, um, for two reasons, I probably ought to follow through with that. One, she's the Chief Justice of Indiana, and I appear in her court with some regularity. <laughs> and secondly, she, by virtue of her position, is the chair of the Judicial, Lam yeah. Judicial Nominating Commission. And well, I'll, I'll give it a whirl. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you never know how mm -hmm. life is going to turn out sometimes. But I applied, and I made it through the first round, and actually made it through the second round. and then. So this is a seven-on-one interview, basically? So what did they ask right. you about? What did you um, talk about? Any number of things, um, from... Uh, why do you root for IU football to um, <laughs> what, uh, what's your judicial philosophy to, you know, hypotheticals. Uh, if, if you were in this kind of a situation, how would you respond as a, as, as a judge? Is it important to you to get it right or to follow precedent if those two things might part company? Um, it was really – and the, the first round interviews probably were more conversational and chatty mm -hmm. than – the second round, which got really um, appreciably more difficult and asked for a lot of doctrinal uh, philosophical questions about the role of the court, the role of judiciary, the judiciary and the constitutional scheme. Um, but uh, did you feel uh, so this is a appropriate conversation on the day that the that the Gorsuch hearings begin for the U.S. Supreme Court? Did you ever feel like you were being asked to sort of decide how you would rule on a specific question? Uh, and did that give you pause? Were there times you had to say, I really don't think it's appropriate for me to answer that because it's kind of getting ahead of things? I, of the probably 50 or 60 questions that I got asked over those multiple interviews, I can recall one question from a lawyer member who asked about a particular provision of our state constitution mm -hmm. and how I thought it ought to be interpreted. What I, and, what my, and my response was, well, the longstanding precedent of our Supreme Court has been, this is what this provision means. Um, I've not studied it closely enough to know whether that's a correct interpretation, but I know that's what our Supreme Court has said for a long time. And to the extent that you want me to talk about particular application of that, I hope you understand I just can't go into the, into the details. And that seemed to satisfy that uh, that member, um, we, but, but they, they'll, they'll, rightly so, they'll press as much as they can to try to learn what uh, what makes you tick and sure. what uh, animates your your, your worldview, your judicial philosophy. Mm -hmm. 
but I had the same kind of reciprocal obligation to avoid committing to a particular position in a case that, uh, that might come before the court. So then after being advanced as a finalist, you have an interview with then Governor Pence. What did you talk well, about? Well, first there was an interview with his, his staff. Okay. Um, so I actually wound up four different interviews, two okay. before the Judicial Nominating Commission, um, an interview before the governor's counsel um, and some deputy counsel within his office, who actually I understand had sent out to all three of us um, a series of um, various constitutional I think they were all, maybe with one exception, constitutional cases from both the Indiana Supreme Court and the Supreme Court of the United States, and said, uh, you know, be prepared to address some of the issues that are raised in these opinions, hmm. um, and um, did, and yeah. then met with the governor yeah. afterward. And what was that like? That was uh, both uh, um, kind of an anxious, uh, nervous time, but it was also, uh, I, I found it really uh, uh, very rewarding. He was uh, very personable. He was a, a, a good guy. Um, my, uh, I, I had spent, I'm trying to remember, I guess it was in 2013, he and I and probably a dozen other people had spent some time at a Liberty Fund colloquium um, down in Brown County at the Story Inn on the 1816 and 1851 constitutions. We reminisced a little bit about what a rewarding mm -hmm. uh, experience that was. Uh, we talked about um, his judicial philosophy as well as my own. Were there particular cases that I thought were especially well done or troubling? Uh, did I find, or what was my judicial philosophy? Were there any um, sitting or former justices of the Supreme Court for, for whom I had a particular affinity or regard? Um, it probably went 30, 40 minutes yeah. and uh, very, very personable. And Okay. I want to uh, just ask two last questions and then see if sure. there are people in the audience who have questions. One, circling back to what I said earlier, what was it like to transition from being a an advocate to now being a neutral? One thing I've noticed in a couple of your opinions I've read, you, you use sort of Roman numeral headings, point headings, uh, which, is a little happens, die hard. which is a little unusual. It's like reading a legal brief in some ways rather than a judicial opinion. So, so what was it like transitioning in mindset from having to make an argument on behalf of one side, um, no matter how difficult or, or, or uh, 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 challenging, to being a neutral arbitrator now? Uh, that's it's, it's a great question, and frankly, that's been the hardest part of the job transition. Um, I've been out of law school not quite 30 years now, uh, except for the first two years when I was clerking. All of that time, whether in private practice or for the Attorney General's office, has been as an advocate. Um, and my job, of course, was to urge a particular result for a client. I knew in advance going in what, what the outcome the client wanted. And my job as the lawyer was to strategize with colleagues and put together the best legal argument to advance the ball on behalf of the client. Mm -hmm. And now for the first time in my career, I'm trying to get it right, whatever that means in a particular case. And it's been a, it's been a tough transition. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're, you're very uh, astute when you recognize that my judicial opinions read a lot like lawyers' briefs and that I've got a lot of uh, headings. It mm -hmm. seems to me that no less as a, as a lawyer as, than a, as a judge is it important to make sure the reader understands what the, mm -hmm. where I'm going and try to make it a, a user-friendly, easily read mm -hmm. uh, judicial opinion. And I'm, I'm trying to stick to that, uh, stick to that script. Um, uh, last question from me uh, before we throw it open. Um, y y y your court is a five-member court, so yes. unlike the U.S. Supreme Court, which is nine, or I think some state Supreme Courts are seven, it's a relatively small number of people. Just what are the uh, what are the relationships like among colleagues on your court? Uh, at the U.S. Supreme Court, we hear, uh, I, I think it's still the case, they, don't, they still don't use email. I mean, they still use messengers to take things from one office to another and so forth. Um, how in Informal or formal are your relationships with your colleagues? Well, I, I, I only just there. There, of course, I have four colleagues. Only Justice Mass is someone I knew well before either of us was a judge. So from day one, it was much more informal. From mm -hmm. from day one, I referred to him as Mark, and uh, mm -hmm. and we, we got along great. Um, with my other colleagues, since I'd known them only as, as judges, and in the case of two of them, uh, I'm sorry, three of them, as members of the Supreme Court mm -hmm. uh, 
they were always Justice so-and-so, and it took a while for me to get accustomed to calling the Chief Justice Loretta or uh, you know, my 70-year-old colleague, Justice Robert Rucker, who's stepping down shortly to call him Bob or Robert. But um, it uh, took a little getting used to, but uh, they're, they've been wonderfully welcoming and kind to me, and it's a, it's a great atmosphere. It's a really good group. Um, we we do get you, on well. Is, do you sort of drop into each other's offices for chats, or is it uh, a little bit more... Uh, Formal and proper um, than that. Well, Justice Mass is my next door neighbor. I don't know if you know how the the way that we're set up in the state house. Well, you know the we're all on the third floor, as is as are the two legislative chambers. The house is on the east side of the building. Yeah. The Senate's on the west side. Our courtroom is on the far north side of the building. Mm-hmm. So. Rucker and Rush and David are on the north side of the building, north of the legislative chambers, and only Massa and I are south. Oh, okay. So he's my next door neighbor, and particularly during baseball season, he's a big. Mm-hmm. He grew up in Milwaukee. He's a big Brewers fan, so we would spend as much time. Maybe I shouldn't say this. Talking baseball <laughs> is talking about the, the court's business. But, uh, we, uh, we, we, you know, there's a there's a great deal of camaraderie among us, and we'll chat, just stop by and visit to talk about an opinion, or uh, did you see that the news of the day, or uh, let's uh, you know. Let's, uh, yeah. let's go to lunch. And Justice Massa was another daily student that's, alum, that's although exactly he didn't right. overlap. He was a sports writer at the paper. Um, okay, so let's see what questions people have for you. Yes. <laughs> short, short answer, sure. Um, as, a, as an undergraduate in economics, the, the Milton Friedmans, the Friedrich Hayek's, um, you know, the, the, the classic Hayek work, Road to Serfdom, I was a, a absolutely had a huge influence on, on me as a as, as a young man. Um, Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom, his 1962 book. There was, he later in the 1970s or 80s had Free to Choose, after which a PBS series was was later written. Um, uh, a lot of the uh, the Swiss, um, I'm sorry, the, the, Swiss, the Austrian uh, economists um, were, were big in, influences um, on the legal on the legal side. Um, Posner, uh, uh, Richard Epstein, um, Posner for his law and economics, Richard Epstein for his libertarian view of how the Constitution ought to be interpreted. Um, certainly Scalia, uh, Bork, and his uh, tempting of America text um, those are, are you know classics from from their from, from the outset and I think remain so today you'd also ask about role models I think or, or influential did that capture it as yeah. well okay okay all right other questions in the corner there Thank you. Um, as you've mentioned, it's now your job to say what the law is for the state of Indiana, and I'm just curious um, what you think of your role in developing Indiana's constitutional law either in parallel with or independently from um, the federal constitution, and kind of more generally, how much do you look to other courts and other um, precedents to kind of say where Indiana should move? That's, That's a, a great question. question. That's state a great constitutional question. law it's kind of an underdeveloped field of study at many law schools, isn't it? Well, so I well, think that's a great well, question. It certainly was in our court as well until probably the, the late 80s to early 90s and beginning with uh, Chief Justice Randy Shepard, who was probably the longest serving Chief Justice on our court. Um, there, began to de- to, 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 there began to be a departure from what had been traditionally um, adhering and interpreting our own state constitutional provisions according to the federal the federal counterpart. We have, for example, under Article 1, Section 23 of our state constitution, our Equal Privileges and Immunities Clause. For years, that had been interpreted essentially the same way as the Federal Equal Protection Clause until 1994, and Justice Dixon's opinion for our court conspicuously and notably put us on a different path so that we now have a very different um, jurisprudence under our Equal Privileges and Immunities than under the federal constitution. Um, um, I certainly believe, and I think it's true of most, if not all, of my colleagues, that uh, the Indiana Constitution should be read on its own based on the text, history, structure of our own Constitution to the extent there's overlap. In fact, I would let me, just one point on that. Um, our um, 
Fourth Amendment counterpart in Indiana um, reads verbatim to the federal constitution, the Fourth Amendment um, protection against um, uh, uh, the uh, probable cause shall not issue. Uh, um, the, the, the Fourth Amendment jurisprudence has been interpreted very differently. And beginning in the Litchfield case from our court, we have, we have construed our state constitutional provision very different than the federal counterpart, even though the, the provisions are, are identical. Um, but, or, I, I don't know if you could generalize, but in, in this, in, in the, 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 for, the criminal procedure, the Fourth Amendment area, the equal privileges and immunities, would you say has Indiana moved in a direction that is more protective of individual yes. liberties than the federal constitution or less? G generally more protective, so more protective. though not, uni not uniformly so. But, but yes, as a, as a general rule, it has been more protective. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh. What was what was my answer? Um, I don't remember my answer. I'm told, was, I'm told I gave a good answer, but I'm sorry I don't remember the specifics. But. The, if I'm answering your question today, it would be the, the unhelpful, lawyerly response is it depends. Um, a lot of, I, I certainly believe in getting it right, but the role of, the role of precedent in our s system is also highly important. And the extent to which there have been expectations that have been built around uh, a constitutional interpretation, even if we th might think it's wrong today, if there have been too many expectations, commercial interests and otherwise that have built up around that interpretation, um, I'm less likely to think that it, it's important to deviate from that precedent and, um, and, and follow what I think might have been the original meaning. Um, just, just as one aside, if I may, um, this has been a few years ago now, but I have taken a course through the Federalist Society that Justice Scalia used to teach every other year at, uh, um, at a uh, Ritz-Carlton resort in the, uh, the Rocky Mountains, a couple hours west of Denver, on separation of powers. And when he was presented with some of these hypothetical type questions, um, it, was it was clear that f t to me from his response that, for example, he believed that um, he, he wasn't sure that incorporation the incorporation doctrine made much sense, the idea of, you know, of applying to the states through the 14th Amendment's due process clause, all the provisions of the Bill of Rights. But at, at the same time, he said, that ship has sailed. Um, now, Brother Clarence, referring to Justice Thomas, might well go back to that view, but he said, um, I'm not about to revisit some of those things, even though I'm not sure it makes the best sense as a matter of constitutional history. Um, there are any number of those doctrines in which I say, uh, that ship has sailed. Um, what, what, would I have been deciding that as a first matter? Perhaps not, but um, I'm not about to settle or to unsettle uh, years or sometimes generations of precedent just because I think it may have been decided incorrectly. You, way you back mentioned when. that you have dissented in some cases. Um, have you kind of developed a philosophy of when something is? Uh, how common are dissents in your court? Again, it's a they're small very rare. court. I would think they're not terribly common. They're it's not, not as divided and political as the U.S. Supreme correct. Court. So. What triggered for you the urge to say, no, I just see this a different way and I'm going to dissent? Um, we have probably unanimity, I would think, I think it's the last numbers I saw, 83% of the time. So five out of six cases mm -hmm. are, are unanimous 5-0 decisions from our court. Um, the two cases in which I dissented um, were, I think it's true, both of them were statutory cases. And I just, I, I wanted to make, I wanted to lay a marker in one case because I thought it was important for um, the, 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 uh, the bar and the, 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 the lower courts that were going to be deciding some of these questions to know that Slaughter's worldview when it comes to interpreting a statute is um, even if the legislature may have enacted a silly statute, this is, these are the words that they wrote and we're going to follow it. Mm -hmm. At least that was my, my view. Mm -hmm. um, trying to remember what prompted my other dissent. Um, if, if, if pressed, I might be able to think of it in a Absolutely. few minutes, but I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the, okay. on the second one. Yeah. Um, I should also say that um, two early dissents might also reflect the fact that I was a brand new justice at the time and um, need to learn to keep my powder dry going forward, that you don't just, every time you disagree with a colleague, shoot off a dissent. Mm -hmm. um, one, one learns as one spends time on a collegial court, and uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm still learning. Okay. Other questions?
or, or could you see going back to private practice after a successful and fulfilling uh, time on this court? So, well, since I've been on board nine months, I'm not ready to yeah. <laughs> send out my resume quite yet. But uh, um, yeah, I, sure, sure, I, I could imagine doing something else after this. Um, the, uh, we have a recent uh, a Maurer alum from 82 who served in our court with distinction for, for 19 years, Justice Frank Sullivan, who's now teaching um, at the McKinney School in Indianapolis. But he was a by appointee as a relatively young man, um, served, as I said, almost 20 years on our court and has spent the last several years since 2012 teaching. Um, is he going to do something after his teaching gig? I don't know. But um, I, I have a lot of interests, and though I enjoy my current job, I don't want to foreclose the prospect that I might do something else down the road. Um, just to address the point that you touched on, there really is not a lot of, lot of turnover in our court. In fact, with Justice Robert Rucker's appointment in 1999 by Governor O'Bannon, there went then a series of the longest period in our state's history, 11 years when there was no turnover on our court. Um, but unlike federal judgeships, which are life tenured, our, under our Constitution, we age out at 75. Um, beginning in 2010, with the appointment of uh, Justice David, who succeeded Ted Bohm on our court, there began the, um, a series of uh, turnovers through retirements or otherwise, aging out. Um, now, with the, the appointment uh, coming up by Governor Holcomb to succeed or to fill the spot left by Justice Rucker's retirement, uh, we will have turned over completely all five seats in just seven years. Um, the four of us who remain, I'm the youngest at 54, uh, Steve David's the oldest at 59, so the rest of us could be on that court for a while. There could be another dozen, 12, 15 years before there's any uh, appreciable turnover. So um, it, 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 tends to go in, it tends to go in waves that way, but uh, um, we'll, we'll see how long the current crop of us stick around. Another question? Professor Lon? Yeah. Thank you. Um, or you go ahead and use the microphone just for the benefit of the video. Sure. I think. Judge, uh, as Professor Sanders has, has indicated, you have had a long career as an advocate before you went on the bench, and as you just mentioned, it's only been nine months since you assumed the bench. But I wondered if, uh, notwithstanding that and the fact that you came to the court presumably with already a pretty sophisticated knowledge of appellate advocacy, wondered if you've already had time to register the different perspective from the other side of the bench from the uh, standpoint of kind of things that – every lawyer should know about how judges make decisions and how judges receive their advocacy that perhaps you've observed that lawyers don't know. My second question is whether the Cubs are going to repeat, and you can answer either, either one I'll of answer those. answer the second question first, yes. <laughs> um, I've, I've been uh, a little surprised on the other side of the bench in, in a couple of respects. One of them is that I... Um, I, I love, I, as, a, as an advocate, I loved preparing for and pre preparing for and delivering an, an oral argument. I thought there were very few intellectual challenges really as satisfying as being nervous about and delivering a, a terrific first-rate kind of knock it out of the park oral argument. Um, I've come to I've come to see from the other side of the bench, in the overwhelming majority of cases, how little. Um, the oral argument actually changes things. I, I, I find it to be extremely worthwhile. I, I relish the, I still enjoy the oral argument process. I think it's really important, unlike our Intermediate Court of Appeals, which holds oral argument maybe in two or three percent of the cases. Overwhelming majority of their cases are decided simply on the briefs. Um, the, the outcome in our court is generally the same. That is, um, it, it's, it's the rare case in which oral argument has actually changed the outcome in my view. Um, I've probably sat through two or three dozen, 30 or 40 oral arguments since I joined the court, and I can think of one case in which um, the, the advocate changed my mind after the way I perceived the case, the way I thought that I was going to be deciding the case going in. Um, for, so the advocates, the important thing to keep in mind as a, a written advocate is there's no substitute for being um, brief and concise and making your point up front and not droning on and on in a, in a brief on an issue that uh, – or, or collateral issues that may not uh, advance the ball a great deal. Uh, the, the oralists, from the perspective of the oralists, um, of course, you need to know your record cold, know the law cold, but really understand what it is you're trying to accomplish in an oral argument. Um, we're fortunate in our court to have probably two or three dozen 
what I call frequent flyers who come before us with some regularity, the Attorney General's Office, the State Public Defender Agency, maybe a dozen or so uh, skilled private, se private practice lawyers who come before us. And they, almost without exception, do an, do an excellent job. But occasionally you'll get trial lawyers from uh, an out, out of Indianapolis County who really have never been argued in an appellate tribunal before, and they treat an appellate argument as though they're arguing in front of a jury. And they really don't understand what the appellate process is all about. They don't understand what the, the goal of an appellate argument is all about. And um, it's they haven't advanced their client's ball. It's been largely a waste of time for the court. And to the extent that uh, somebody can come in and understand what the, the goal of the oral argument is, which is to um, polish for the court, and let me just back up if I may, um, young, un inexperienced appellate advocates um, often feel frustrated that they're being interrupted by questions because they have their script and by golly they want to get through their, their text and uh, what are you doing bothering me with questions? And I hope you all have learned, if you haven't already, from Professor Lon and his, his counterparts, um, the importance of really relishing listening to the questions that come from the court because our view, our world view is you've just consumed a, you know, dozens and dozens of pages of briefs um, about what your th world view is, what your theory of the case is and why you believe your client ought to win. And our perspective from the oral argument is you've told us now why you think they ought to, you, your, your client ought to win. It's our chance now to push back, to test the implications of the theory that you're asking us to address. Um, what, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and as an advocate, as I became more seasoned and sophisticated an advocate, I came to appreciate, this, because this is really the one and only chance that I'm going to have 15, 20, 30 minutes with the five judges, the justices who are going to be deciding my client's fate. So I want to listen really carefully to what their questions are and what their concerns are and be able to address specifically, not getting to it in three or four minutes, but when, when uh, my colleague says, isn't it the case that such, you know, that such and such is going to happen if you decide the case, um, if we decide the case your way? Uh, you might say, well, don't, no, don't be concerned about that because, or yes, that is going to be the outcome, and you should, and you should relish that because. You, you need to understand um, what your theory of the case is, what the court's concerns may be, and be in a position to know your case well enough to be able to um, address those concerns in a way that's going to uh, advance the ball for your client. Um, all right, great. Well, this has been such a rare opportunity and a real pleasure for me, and I hope a great learning experience for all of you as well. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. This is great. Yeah, it's so enjoyable. Yeah.